today on the Star Wars Show. Star Wars author E.K. Johnston talks to costume designer Trisha Bigger about her prequel fashions. We go behind the scenes of Star Wars Jedi Temple Challenge. We hang out with more adorable Star Wars animals and much, much more. Hello and welcome to another brand new and fun-filled episode of the Star Wars Show from Home. But it's not just another ordinary episode from home with random cameos from our celebrity friends and or our pets. No, sir. Today is our Star Wars Show behind the scenes spectacular. How spectacular, you may be wondering? Well, for starters, we're going to be taking you somewhere you've never been before on this show. Five feet away from where we're shooting. Behold! The magic of at-home studio production. Now you can judge the backgrounds of our homes and the foregrounds of our homes and Anthony's choice in pants. I moved all of the dirty dishes two feet off frame. So So. proud of you. Thank you. It's an exciting time to be alive. And speaking of excitement, this weekend we'll find out if the Star Wars show is going to take home its second Emmy for our Star Wars animal sketch. In fact, here's a behind the scenes look at how it was made. Check it out. Wish you had a microphone. It's good enough. Go. This shoot is going to result in our next Emmy. We're here for the animal trench run shoot. We got all these mini sets, mini X-Wing, mini Falcon, mini TIE Fighter, and all the animals are going to be on green screen. We're going to insert them into the classic trench run scene. It's going to be very exciting. Come with us as we explore the world of making Star Wars. Oh, my crib. <laughs> <laughs> I am currently creating a shot list so that we have a reference for what the animals are going to be doing. Camouflaged into some of my hair. That's why we have blue and green screens because chameleons can change colors. We got to be prepared. I'm just gluing the Millennium Falcon together. This is called space welding. Teamwork makes the steam work. Look how cute our stand-in is. John Knoll and Dennis Muirin have nothing on us. Tomorrow the animals arrive and it's going to be pretty much the best thing ever. There's going to be a hedgehog and a chameleon and a fox and an owl. And they're all going to be fighting the empire. trying to make this R2-D2 hat for our guinea pig to wear. It's probably the coolest thing I've sewn ever. This is Bobby Bobby. He's our African bullfrog. One of the largest species of frogs in the world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm out, guys. If you can get the look up somehow, that would be it kind awesome. of doesn't work that way. <laughs> This is Yemen, our veiled chameleon. He's about four years old, working here today having some fun. This was a good casting. We need the mustache, remember? We need the mustache. Look at his little hands! This is Lily, getting a little Sith action going. Pure evil, as you can see. This is Sally Sue. Red Six standing by. And today she's playing Perkins. There you go. That's perfect. This is Rupert, our hairless kitty pig. Look at him. Nice little spin. This is Zeke. He's a mixed terrier, and he's playing our leading role today. Three, two, one, fire. We are getting ready for the final shot of the day with our dog Chewbacca and our fox Han. Oh, the shoot went so well. All of the animals are great actors. I am really proud of how everyone did. Great job, everyone. Man, what a great shoot. Let me tell you something. Dagger would have made a great Luke Skywalker, but I guess I understand why they use Zeke. Yeah, I mean, Zuko would have been a perfect Darth Vader, too. I'm sorry, but you're both wrong because the smidge would have made the best Darth Vader. Kristen Baver, host of This Week in Star Wars and the Star Wars Show Book Club. What are you doing here? I thought this was password protected. Well, for starters, I was here because I found out that everyone else was showing off their pets, and I will take any opportunity to show off Hector Smidget. But I was also here to share this interview I did with Queen's Perils author E.K. Johnston and prequel costume designer Trisha Bigger to talk all things Padme fashion. Are there animals? I'm sorry to tell you, Andy, there are not. There are zero animals. 
kind of a bummer. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it really is, but it, it's still a really, really good conversation and you guys should check it out. Kristen Baber here, the host of This Week in Star Wars and the Star Wars Show Book Club. And today I have two very special guests, Trisha Bigger, the costume designer from the Star Wars prequels, and E.K. Johnston, the author of Queen's Shadow and Queen's Peril. So today we're going to be talking a lot about Queen Amidala. Trisha, I'm wondering, you really embraced the dress code and the motifs that link the queens of Naboo and their handmaidens, but you also grounded everything with inspiration that you took from cultural and historical pieces that we can find in our own galaxy. Do you recall the most challenging individual Queen Amidala ensemble that you and your team had to create? for the prequels? <laughs> mm, that's quite a difficult question because really there were quite a few dresses that were very challenging. It is a toss-up in a way between probably the throne room costume and I think what we called Travel One, which was a black dress with sort of a spider's web lace all over it that actually the Padme decoy wore part of the time. In each episode there was a difficult or a few difficult dresses. I mean, for instance, in episode two, we started off with four dresses for Padme and ended up with something like 21 dresses for her. So at the beginning, when we started <laughs> prepping, George said, no, we're not going to have many costumes. And then by the time we actually started shooting, we had 21 of them. But yeah, I would say the throne room probably. It was very much like a couture dress because it had to be done in lots of separate pieces and then the pieces all put together at the very end. And I think the dress took about eight weeks in total to make. I talked to a lot of cosplayers and I've seen a couple of people who make this dress and the joke is always like, well, at least we've invented LEDs. So they have like this <laughs> they don't have to carry around the battery anymore. Yes, the battery around the back, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Was there any particular one of Padme's looks that you finished and were like, yes, this one we have absolutely nailed. There's nothing I would do differently. I love it. Send it to be filmed. I don't think... There's one, there were so many. Natalie Portman was a great person to dress because she looks great in everything. Throughout the whole of the trilogy, she was the most fantastic person to put things onto because she had a huge patience. A lot of those costumes took a long time to fit and we had to fit them more than once and there was never a murmur of, oh, you know, can you hurry up? Never, ever, ever. She was really a perfect person to be doing really complicated dresses with. EK, your story deals with Padme's transition from queen to senator, and on film, Trisha certainly explored that transition visually with the wardrobe. Can you talk a little bit about what you were studying during the writing process and how the visual language of the films informed your writing? I think the biggest difference for me was Attack of the Clones in general. Her costuming in Attack of the Clones covers all bases. She has to look soft and romantic. She has to look vulnerable. She has to look professional. And I wanted to sort of sit down and think about what the transition period would look like. And the difference between Senator Amidala and Queen Amidala is mostly color from what I could tell. And I wanted to sort of look into the function of what went into their design. So I had the characters realize that the queen out outfits weren't necessarily going to work for the Senate. And then it's sort of their first big bonding exercise as a team is that they sit down and like design all of the dresses that Trisha designed for the, <laughs> for the movie <laughs> because they have to change her look. As E.K. saying, the, the whole idea of her life being sort of slightly compartmentalized in that film, there are times where she's having a private life. She's able to express how she would like to look when she's alone or at home. It was also just the sort of ideas of going from the sort of reds that we see her in, the sort of very strong regal colours, and the slight changes in shape too, I think. And she also has grown up a little. Time has passed. She's a woman. Times have changed. She has changed and how she looks has changed. So I think it was sort of a natural transference of how instead of being encased or hidden or behind her clothing, she was able to show herself more through what she was wearing and the colours she was choosing. So Trisha, I'm hoping you can answer why is it important to you to bring that level of detail to pieces that may be on screen for a fleeting moment or might just be worn by characters like the handmaidens who are quite often in the background of shots and they're not the focal point at all of what most of the viewers are looking at. I think if things are going to be on the screen, really if you can, they should all be as well made as possible. Particularly doing something like Star Wars where you know there's going to be people looking at it for years and years and years. It makes such a difference when things are lovely. And I'm sort of a bit of a perfectionist on that sort of level. And I think it shows 
suppose when everything works, the pleating's beautifully done, the hems are hand done, all the beautiful finishing, the lace work, and the things are only as good as the people who actually make them. And I've had some really brilliant people working with me. It's great to have top class people working on a project like Star Wars because their skills enable me to design things that are more complicated than you would do. Making these things, creating these things, and how they end up looking is a team effort. I'm really lucky that I've had the opportunity to work with really talented people. EK, I love that your book gives these exquisite costumes even more of a backstory by weaponizing the hairpins and adding escape hatches for the decoy maneuver. What inspired you to add those elements to what you'd seen on the screen from Trisha's workshop? I was like 15 when the movies came out and it was like, I loved the dresses so much. They were life-changing in every possible way. I didn't know anything about costuming at the time, but I could tell that they were like tremendously well constructed and put together and designed and all that kind of stuff. And then when the Ahsoka book came out, I started interacting with cosplayers at conventions. I started to sort of get an idea about how garment construction worked and like the time and the engineering, frankly, that goes into it. So when it came time to write Padme, I wanted to sort of reflect both the like grandeur of the movies of the things that I'd seen, but also the ingenuity and practicality of the people that I'd encountered while I was at convention. There's one dress in particular that I always think about. It was one of my favorite ones to design. She wears it when she's addressing the Senate. It looks like a glitter overlay, like a nice sparkling overlay on the skirt. But what it actually is, is photo receptors so that she cannot be photographed in poor light. <laughs> and I don't know if that's physically possible, but I like the idea. I didn't of, think of that. <laughs> I like the idea that all of this amazing, grand, incredibly talent-based stuff also has really practical applications. That's all the things you can do on paper. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Not but I so don't have to worry about a film budget. I'm always amazed that cosplay people can make such fantastic copies of things, even before they could look at things in really good close-up. I remember going to the first celebration after episode one came out in Denver, and Ian McCaig and I were on stage together chatting, and we looked at the front row of the audience, and apart from there being like 10 perfect Darth Mauls there, all in a row, there were amazing people dressed in costumes that you thought how on earth did he do that really great copies great copies it's one of my favorite parts of conventions especially if someone's been in cosplay for a while and they see a padme who's relatively new i find a lot of them will go out of their way to be like oh this is really cool how did you do this and then rather than being like oh i've been at this for 10 years here is how you stitch that they'll kind of make it like an exchange of information instead so the actual community level is really cool they've got like facebook groups and all kinds of stuff it's fantastic with queen's peril we're going back in time a little bit to Queen Amidala's reign on Naboo. Can you talk a little bit about how the costumes informed some of the decisions in the new book? In Queen's Shadow, I always felt this huge pressure that she had to be wearing something new and amazing in every single scene. So in Queen's Peril, it was a little bit easier because I knew what she was wearing in most of the scenes. I didn't have to decide that. The day in the movie that I always joke about that was a real challenge to write was the five outfit day on Coruscant where she cycles through all these amazing dresses and I had to kind of give her time to change through all of these events because we just see her arrive and then we see her thinking and then we see her speaking and then we see her thinking again and then we see her leaving and I was just like, this girl needs some time to change. <laughs> as much as I loved designing dresses, I also loved getting to use the dresses we already had and sort of put them to their paces, I guess. That is all the questions I have. You have both been so generous with your time today and I thank you so much for hopping on this call so we could chat about Padme Amidala and how enviable her wardrobe is all because of you and your team Trisha. I don't normally enjoy doing video things but actually I really enjoyed this so Wonderful. thank you all. What an awesome interview I mean it blows my mind how much hard work and care Trisha and her team put into every costume it just honestly makes me love every outfit even more. Seriously, eight weeks to make the throne room dress and Natalie Portman had to have a car battery attached to it to make it light up. That is behind the, the scenes, scenes movie, movie magic. magic. Well, Carboni, any other behind the scenes looks for our friends at home? Oh yeah, and it is a good one. Ooh, what's this one about? It is about the new Star Wars kids game show, Jedi Temple Challenge, which no big deal. I did get to go visit the set and run the course. Yeah, of course you did. You were a blue barracuda as a kid and you get to run inside the Jedi Temple as an adult. Salt meat wounds. Let me guess. Now I have to watch you having fun without me? Oh no, I'm not in this one. Our crew wasn't shooting when I stopped by. Thank the maker. Excuse me? Nothing, roll it. Could have sworn I heard you say something. Uh. 
Okay, here we go. Count you down. Three, two, one, go. Jedi Temple Challenge is where three teams of Padawans compete in three different trials, showing off their strength, knowledge, and bravery in order to become Jedi Knights. This is an idea that, in general, has been percolating around the Star Wars online team for many years. We've always wanted to do something in the crazy large activity game show world, and here we are. This brilliant idea came from a love of game shows when I was growing up, and when also Scott was growing up, and just having a deep affinity for inspiring imagination and letting kids have fun and being able to capture that and wanting to find a marriage of that type of game show format with Star Wars because it felt like a really perfect coupling. I like to call it an action-adventure kids game show like you've never seen before. I've never seen anything this intense. I feel like we've taken the show to the next level and you're living in the world of Star Wars. What could be better than that? When we were producing Star Wars Celebration in Chicago, Ahmed came back for the 20th anniversary of Phantom Menace. He came and he did the Star Wars show live, and we all kind of looked at each other and were like, this is our guy. We were already developing the show at the time, and once that kind of kernel was planted, we just followed it and started kind of developing the host's narrative around him. Stem back in Star Wars is a bit surreal. It took me a long time to come back, but you know, it's always been a love and everyone at Lucasfilm has always been great to me and Star Wars has given me so much in my life that it's really good to know that I have family here and I always have a home in the Star Wars universe. And I'm wearing a lot less latex this time around, which is way more comfortable. Come on, let's go. Wait, where, where are we going? Let's go, Ivy. I'm coming. I'm the guy in the droid. It's puppeteering the costume for Mary Holland, who's extremely talented. We went through a bunch of concepts for the droid and concept artwork back and forth until something was approved and then basically 3D printed most of the parts and then did a lot of fiberglass work to make sure they're strong enough to be worn on set. Doing the voice for a character that another actor is physically playing is very interesting. <laughs> I've never done that before, but it's so much fun. It's almost like there are two minds at work to make this character come to life. The dynamic between Keller and Beck and AD3 is super fun. They're like a married couple. They sort of tease each other, but it's all in good fun. One thing I've discovered in playing her is that she's really jealous of all these young Padawans. <laughs> she wants to do all these challenges and wants to use the Force, but as a droid, she can't. But that's been a fun dynamic to play. For LX R5, Killian Plunkett had done some designs, and so we chatted a little bit about the colors and whatnot, what type of droid it would be. So it was an R5 style droid. By the time we finally locked in the design, I only had about three weeks to work on it. It wound up being a 16-day build. So that was a huge challenge trying to get it finished on time. I mean, we literally wheeled it in on set. I think the paint was still fresh. Ooh, this is my favorite part. You are now Jedi Knight. This experience has been crazy and awesome because I got to meet a lot of people and friends. I never thought I would be on a show like this. It was pretty fun. I never thought I was actually going to be on a Star Wars themed game show. I didn't know that this was going to happen. So I'm like, oh my God. The kids actually make this show really special. They were the reason why I decided to come here and to see them go through the trials and really work together and take the idea of being a Jedi seriously. They care. They really want to become Jedi Knights and by the end when they put their robes on and they light their lightsabers, they believe it and they feel it and that's infectious. And for me, that's what Star Wars has always been about. You're watching the Star Wars show. We did it! Another month of 2020 wrapped up and in the books. Time is a flat circle now and means nothing. Hooray! <laughs> Remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And as always, may the Force be with you. Now to take off these uncomfortable work clothes, huh? He loves you so much and he loves this and he's having a great time. <laughs>